someone who is in need over the next couple of weeks, please sign up to do that. That would be very helpful. Any other announcements? No Bible study or Pioneer Club this week. Today is the last day. The 28th is the last day for 27 to be ordered. Okay, 28th, last day for 27 for Christmas. Okay, we go into our prayers and praises. We have Avery Martin uh, listed. Please pray for them. Amber Potter, Kelly Potter, and Danny Dick is in the hospital with COVID. So please continue to pray for those people and lift them up. Other prayers or praises? Yes, sir, Donnie? Uh, I heard from Jim Moore and said Patty is doing well. She had got her cast off. She's in a boot now. And she's got to start therapy on Monday to learn how to walk again. Yeah. But everything's going well. And they won't be back till around December 17th or so. So we won't see Jim and Patty for a while. So continue to lift them up. Also, people traveling over this holiday. And Hunter's going out tomorrow. Any others? Or praises? They're always good. Okay, scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Let's go ahead and stand. Sing. Praises to the Lord. <coughs>
go ahead and take a moment just to open your communion packages. Take time to do that. Two simple items. A little wafer of unleavened bread, recognizing the body of Christ, and a little swallow of juice, representing the blood of Jesus Christ. As we quickly approach Thanksgiving, I'm going to ask each of you to take some time between now and Thursday to read Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Between now and Thursday. This could be called the Thanksgiving of the Redeemed. The first verse in and of itself says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Now this psalm is 43 verses long, so I'm not going to read it, but what it does is celebrates how much we should be thankful for what God has done for his redeemed people. The psalm in and of itself talks a lot about the depths to which God's people plunge themselves. It portrays those who are hopeless and lost and powerless to save themselves. That reminds you of anyone? Us and our sin. This is a constant refrain through this whole psalm, which says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. It's what we're called to do. Cry to the Lord. Ask forgiveness and repent. Verse 13 says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought away their chains and took them out of the deepest of gloom. Let's give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. So what do we do when he pulls us out of that distress? We give thanks. And one of the last verses says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people. We who are in Christ are the redeemed. We are the assembly of the people. We come each Sunday to praise him and glorify him and lift up his name for who he is and the promises he keeps. But specifically at this time, we gather around the table to partake of the emblem to remember the love, the mercy, and the grace that was extended to us through Jesus Christ. So let's do that now as we meditate for a moment. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds just to shut your eyes and meditate, and I'll pray for the emblem. Father, we give thanks to you each and every day. We know who you are. We know the love that you have and the mercies that are extended to us each and every day. But at this time, we come with communion with you and we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and the chance of salvation only through him and the blood shed for us. Help us to recognize that we were powerless. It was only through your grace that we have the opportunity to know you and love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for these people who love you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. pray that this week you guys have a happy Thanksgiving with your family, and I hope and pray that first and foremost, though, you'll take time to thank God for all his blessings and what he's done uh, for us. Um, please, if you, if you are blessed enough to live in a family of fellow Christians, and someone speaks on God's behalf to give praise to God, great. But if somebody does not, please politely stand up and say, Let's remember what God has done for us, and then if you would have a prayer for your family. Okay, let's, let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done for us. God, thank you for your precious Son, Jesus Christ, and in him, we, in him alone we have salvation. God, I pray your uh, blessings upon this message. Fill us and lead us, God, with your Holy Spirit. Direct our steps in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning's going to be a different type of message uh, than in any other message, really, that I've done in a very long time. Um, this morning I'm going to be um, going back and sharing some information that's vital that you must know. Uh, what we'll be studying today. The Bible and prayer were removed from schools in 1962 and 63. Uh, three different um, Supreme Court decisions took prayer and scripture out of schools. Um, spiritually, as a nation, the wheels have come off uh, really ever since then. Add that, the removal from, with God's word being removed from the churches as well, and also the truth about history being erased, uh, or at least trying to be erased. And we see why we are in the position that we're in as a nation today. It's time for us as Christians to lovingly, politely, yet firmly say, no more. No more. No more removing God's word. No more uh, removing God. No more uh, removing the truth about Christianity in our history. Enough is enough. We need to speak the truth in love, and even if it takes us peacefully, mind you, even if it takes us one school board at a time, one book at a time, one curriculum at a time, it's time for us to restore God and God's Word and the truth in every area of our culture. Yes, do this with prayer. It has now been almost 60 years since the truth was removed from our schools, and unless you, unless you had the privilege of going to a Christian school or a private school who may have taught this, it's a, there's a really good chance today that many of you have never heard what I'm going to be sharing with you today, or perhaps only very small parts of it. <laughs> when Israel and Judah removed truth, removed truth and began to worship false gods, they fell. In Job chapter 12, it says this. Job chapter 12, verse 23. He, Yahweh God, okay, he, God, makes the nations rise and fall. He builds some up, and he abandons others. Now, that's the message there, uh, as far as the message translation there. It's a little bit of a paraphrase, but it, it really, honestly, is very close. He makes nations rise and fall. Makes nations rise and fall. He builds some up, and he abandons others. From all my studies, from all my studies, I cannot think of one time, not one time, where God abandoned the people first. Not once did God abandon the people first. Instead, the people always abandoned God first. And then he abandoned them. The scriptures teach us in Job chapter 12, verse 13. To God, Yahweh, belong wisdom and power and counsel and understanding. They are his. If we walk with God as individuals, as a church, and as a nation, God will bless us with wisdom and power and counsel and understanding. However, if we don't walk with God, uh, God can tear down. And what, what, once God tears it down, it cannot be rebuilt. It cannot be rebuilt. We also know that with greater knowledge and greater understanding comes a greater level of accountability. Right? I mean, if you've got a little one, a real small little one in your house, um, <laughs> I mean, this is illustration this here. Alright, when Ellie was one and two, and she would chase the dogs around the house, and she would pull their hair, right? And the dogs didn't like it, but they didn't bite her, right? But she didn't get in trouble. Why? Because she was one or two, and she had no idea what she was doing. The dogs watched out for her, right? But now, if you have a seven-year-old kid that goes around and starts mistreating your dog, right? Then you're, you're going to, hey, you know better than that. You're seven years old. You know you're not supposed to mistreat it. So, with a greater level of understanding, with a greater level of knowledge, comes a greater level of accountability. That makes sense to us, I think. Therefore, it's essential that we know the scriptures. It's essential that we know the scriptures for repentance, revival, and survival. But, it's all, but we also must know the truth about our history. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you the truth about our fellow Christians, the pilgrims who came before us. There's a great deal that we can learn from them and from their example. This used to be taught in the schools, and it is vital that we know this information. Do not let people erase, do not let people erase or cancel your history or your culture. Enough is enough. 
If you look at the scriptures, it says, remember, remember, remember. On and on and on in the scriptures, it says, remember God, remember what God did for you. But over and over and over in the scriptures, we need to remember who God is and what God has done for us. We must know the Bible, but we must also know the truth about our history. Now, I'm going to ask a favor of you this morning, and we uh, plan this out. I wonder why the strips of tape on the floor. Well, now you're going to find out. Okay, so I want to ask you to do something. This will be different, to be a little bit unusual, but I need your help. Everybody's help. Uh, I want to try to give you guys a perspective of what it was like for the pilgrims coming over on the Mayflower. So what I need from you guys, you guys on this side of the room, okay, and there's pews here on the, onto the back right there, um, and you guys can stand as far up as up here if you wanted to, okay? But I need all you guys on that side of the room to please come over here just for, this will be less than five minutes, okay? I just want to give you an illustration, okay? All you guys, if you would come over here and just get in one of these pews right here, if you would, please. <clears throat> can we go here? Yes, go any, any pew over here is good. Thank you all very much. And you can come on up here too if you need to. If there's not enough space in the back, you can come on up here as well. <laughs> this is good. Good, good, good. Now, I try to keep on your toes. You never know what kind of illustration I'm going to do, but this, this came to me this week. I was like, I need to try this. Okay? So, um, if you guys, now in the uh, historical record that we'll be looking at here in just a few minutes, the Mayflower, the ship, you've got the picture of, please throw it up there, uh, Jason. Okay, please. Um, the Mayflower, the ship itself, okay, the, what I've seen was 25 feet wide, and uh, the most conservative estimates have it at 90 feet long. Okay, so we measured it off. Okay, that front wall in the back of the baptistry to just about the end of the table where you get your communion is 90 feet. Okay, measured off. So that's how long it was. Okay, now they had, they had three different compartments in the back of the ship back there. Okay, so nobody would have been staying back there. Okay, that would have been uh, for storage, that kind of thing, and also beneath the ship. And the captain's, was up, uh, the captain's neck was up top. But they also had a compartment up here as well. So where you guys are sitting is basically exactly where uh, the amount of space that the pilgrims would have had to come over on a ship. Now, we've been running probably all oh, 65 or 70. They had 102 people. Now, granted, the captain had his own quarters, okay? So, you know, you're talking at least 80 to 100 people in this small of a space for 66 days, okay? Now, if y'all would do me a favor, uh, stand up, please. And look to your right. And by the way, Robin, thank you for helping measure all this stuff up. And, and uh, uh, there's some other people helping. Uh, this might help me also, too. Uh, too. If you guys look to the right, you'll see a blue marker, okay? If your head is above that blue piece of tape, congratulations, you just bumped your head on the bottom of the top there. Okay, now, all right, because they had only five and a half feet of space, okay? So you guys can go back to your seat now. I just wanted to share that with you. And I would guess, it looks like they might have Early. 70, 75 feet this morning, so this whole thing would have been completely full. It would have been completely full. We're not staying 60. Wow, that's a good, uh, yeah, just an illustration. <laughs> We're not staying that's what, Yeah, that's why I didn't keep you there for a while. Okay, so, all right. So, um, but if we, I, we usually, or after 65 or 70, I think, honestly, we probably would have another 30 people over here if we were going to completely, uh, 30 to 35 probably be right there at that number. So, um, it would have been super cramped, okay? Uh, this is before the days of modern, uh, well, Right. And it was old ship, we'll just say that. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Conveniences. Yeah, modern conveniences, we'll say that. Okay, all right, so uh, we're going to jump back in here. Uh, the history and story of the pilgrims. Um, it has been said, out of small beginnings, great things have been accomplished. Out of small beginnings, great things have been accomplished. It was a very small, weary band of travelers who carried with them the dream of greatness to these very shores over 401 years ago, and set out what would be known as one of the greatest sagas, the Pilgrim Adventure. <laughs> Much of this has been taken out of Plymouth, Plymouth Plantation to the history of the Pilgrims. It's a first-hand account. Um, and chapter 1 mentions this. It's a first-hand account, mind you. It is well known unto the godly since the first breaking out of light of the gospel in our honorable nation of England, that Satan hath raised and maintained and continued wars in opposition to the saints. Our story begins with the recollect recollections of Governor William Bradford, 
in his classic memoirs entitled Of Plymouth, of Plymouth Plantation. For Bradford and the others who eventually came to the shores of America, the Pilgrim Adventure began in the 17th century England on a rather unhappy note. The political climate in King James England, the political climate in King James England, for, uh, for one who didn't strictly abide by the Church of England, was very perilous at best. I will make them conform, claimed King James, or I will harass them out of the land. Which meant he would conduct raids upon them, he would seize their property, he would persecute them to the extent that they would be glad to leave England, which is what eventually happened. Historian and direct pilgrim descendant, uh, Dr. Robert Bartlett, says this. It was against the law. It was against the law to have any kind of religious meeting in secret or separate from the Church of England. Even to read the Bible out loud in public was a criminal offense. Think about that for a minute. Even to read the Bible out loud in public was a criminal offense in the time in which they lived. Ironically, King James is best known today for the Bible translation that bears his name. But make no mistake, he was a tyrant. He was a tyrant. He was against religious liberty. Every chance he had, if it wasn't the Church of England, he tried to stamp out other Christians repeatedly. Nonetheless, he and, and his men persecuted all nonconformists to the Church of England, including a small group of Christians that formed a congregation in central England known as um, in the small town of Scrooby. No, not, not Scooby, not like Scooby-Doo, but Scrooby, the little town of Scrooby. Uh, this particular group of Christians formed a tight-knit congregation by making a binding covenant in 1606. It was a covenant that they agreed all that, um, that all would hold each other accountable and go through hardship together. No matter what it cost them, they were going to walk in unity and in purity of the gospel. The Scrooby congregation, guys, it was a congregation. Think about this. Think about it. If we were living in England at the time, and we were being persecuted, and we were being allowed to worship God, how God had called us to worship Him, would we make that same journey? I hope and pray that we would, but that's what they did. They stepped out in faith. They were like, we're going. We're going to find a place of religious liberty. Uh, because of mounting dangers for all nonconformists to the Church of England, and the fear that the king might disband their group, Minister John Robinson and the members of the congregation prayerfully decided to seek refuge in Holland, which at the time offered refuge for those seeking religious freedom. Although King James threatened to harass them, to harass all nonconformists out of the land, they soon discovered that their volunteer departure would not be welcomed either. <clears throat> when they first tried to go out secretly on a Dutch ship in 1607, they were arrested. <coughs> They were arrested, and all the male leaders were thrown into prison in Boston, England, where they were kept for several weeks. The pilgrims had returned to their home communities. Most of them had already sold their homes. So now they're homeless. They had to wait another year before they could make another attempt to hire a crew to help get them out of England. They eventually were successful, were able to make it to Amsterdam in 1608. Initially in Amsterdam, and later in Lind Linden, the pilgrims enjoyed a peaceful time of spiritual growth for about 10 years. About 10 years they had, uh, they had, they had uh, peace. <clears throat> uh, but they also, their children began to have to work under very difficult physical labor, working 14 hours a day. Okay, also trying to learn a foreign language, it caused the pilgrims to consider leaving Holland. Their children had to do a full day's work to help support the family, and they saw their children, it says, growing old in their youth. Also, they were concerned that their children were being influenced by the worldliness in Holland. And then one of their, their children, they, well, they, they noticed that their children, they noticed that their children were leaving the faith, and they were marrying the Dutch that didn't know God. But furthermore, furthermore, they were not allowed to make converts in Holland. They were not allowed to win people to Christ in Holland among the Dutch, and perhaps the greatest reason that they left Holland. And so, they decided to leave Holland and carry the gospel to parts of the world where the gospel was not yet known. The, the pilgrims prayed to God for his direction and his assistance. That's always a great, part, a, great, a great place to start. God, help me. What is your will? What do you want me to do? Start with God. Okay. They prayed to God for his direction and assistance, and, 
and they met and consulted what particular time, what place to prepare for, where to go. They set their sights upon North America, believing that they might establish a community based upon the word of God there. I don't know about you guys, but this is inspirational. <laughs> they finally decided to settle in parts of Northern Virginia. Now hold on, we'll get the rest of the story here in the middle, okay? They decided to settle in parts of Northern Virginia, which at the time went all the way up to the Hudson River, which is now in New York. Now granted, they did end up settling in Plymouth Rock, now uh, in Massachusetts, but um, that was not a part of their original plan. To finance, and such, to finance such an adventure, they found sympathetic businessmen who were willing to lend them some money for the cost of the trip to North America. A group of businessmen financed to the move, uh, much, uh, much like people would buy a stock today, right? They say, well, okay, um, I'm going to buy this stock and hope that it does well, right? That's kind of what the businessmen did. They're like, okay, we'll invest some, but when we invest, we want to return on our investment. That's what the businessmen were doing, but it's still God provided for them to be able to uh, make the trip. <clears throat> but this time, the Scrooby congregation numbered about 300, and it was decided that only 50 of them, 50 of them would lead the way to America. They purchased a small boat called the Speedwell to supplement the Mayflower, which they rented and hired a ship's crew for. Okay, So they would have had a large ship's crew, plus it says when they set, well, initially there was 50, but you'll understand here, they tried the first time in August, and then they had to try again in September. So something happened, either they increased a few of the people that went of their own group, or they hired a really big crew. But we know for a fact um, there were 102 people on board. Okay. Um, but they, they speak well to supplement the Mayflower, which they rented and hired a ship's crew. This was a unique understanding for not only did the whole families come, uh, come to America on the Mayflower, but all passengers were members of the same congregation. They were one heart of one mind. In those days, it was more accustomed for men to go ahead and then to send for their, uh, their wives and children later. When all the necessary provisions were made and they're ready to leave, they held a prayer meeting on board. They set sail from Southampton with the Speedwell, by the way, with the Speedwell and the Mayflower on August the 5th, 1620. August the 5th, 1620. But the Speedwell proved to be unseaworthy. So a number of those in the Speedwell crammed onto the already overcrowded Mayflower, okay, and finally the Mayflower alone set sail on September the 6th, 1620. This is already a very dangerous time to sail in the North Atlantic. Why? Why would that be a hurricane? That's right, hurricane season, okay? It's a very dangerous time for hurricane season. Uh, but due to unforeseen delays, they thought they had no choice but to go ahead and set sail, entrusting themselves into hand, the hands of God and thanking Him for the good as well as the bad. Now, in chapter 9, which is this William Bradford's first hand account, after we had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, we encountered many times crosswinds and many fierce storms with which the ship was wickedly shaken. The voyage of the Mayflower was an incredible ordeal. They had 102 people on board for 66 days crammed into what would, what have, been, what have, been, a bad, what would have been the in-between decks of the ship, okay? which uh, the cargo would just blow, but some of the cargo would have been in their area as well, likely. It had only five and a half feet of headroom, had only 25 feet wide and 90 feet long, 102 men, women, and children crammed into a very small space, and nobody was allowed on deck, at least most of the time, because of the continual, usually stormy weather. They calmed their fears by singing hymns and praying, but this caused some of the crew to mock and jeer them. One in particular was a ringleader of this mocking. He would always be condemning them and cursing them daily and grievously swearing uh, against them and to them. And but it says this, but it pleased God before half the trip was over, he was stricken with a grievous disease of which he died. The attitude of the ship's entire crew changed totally after that man's death. They got, they got the message and the pilgrims, in spite of their treatment, how they'd been treated, they held a service for them. It was November 9th, 66 days into their journey, that they first sighted land off of Cape Cod. They had intended to land near the Hudson and attempted to sail southward along the coast, but they were hindered in doing so because of the dangerous shoals. Now, the shoals, what's the shoal? I just got one here. What's the shoal? Any, any guys, boaters, fishermen, you know what a shoal is? No, 
Shallow water, yes. Shallow water, sandbars, that kind of thing, okay? All right, so because of the shallow water and sandbars, they could not continue to go further south, okay? That's what the uh, written uh, record said. Okay, so uh, they took to sail south along the coast, but they were hindered from doing so because of the dangerous shoals. They uh, interpreted this, they interpreted this as the providence of God, and I believe it was. And he intended them to stay there. That's how they looked at it. Well, we can't sail south, so it must be the providence of God for us to stay here. Uh, so they landed at Cape Cod. Now, hang on, we hear the rest of the just a little bit. Um, um, this is a first-hand account. Being thus arrived in calm, in calm harbor and brought, sail, and brought sail to land, we fell upon our knees, and we blessed the God of heaven, who had brought us over the vast and furious, furious ocean and delivered us from all perils and miseries thereof, and again set our feet upon the firm and stable earth. For the next few days, they explored the Cape Cod area, uh, the coast, a place for a place to settle. Um, take note of this. It says, since they were not in Virginia. Now think about this for a second. Had they gone just a little bit further south, okay, they would have been under King James's rule still, okay? But because of how God, I believe, worked the whole thing out, they were allowed to set up a, a uh, colony that would honor God, okay? Um, so, um, there were not, uh, okay, so for the, for the next few days, they explored the Cape Cod coast to find a place to settle. Um, they were not, since they were not in Virginia, and therefore they were not under any, they were not under any government's jurisdiction, some of the non-separatists aboard, aboard, they tried to uh, talk about getting out of there, or, you know, striking out on their own. But Bradford and the others realized that this would have been disastrous. For each man's skill was absolutely necessary for the survival of the community. Many of these skills had been learned in Holland. So the pilgrims, mindful of the first covenant that they had made, and held them together for the past 14 years at this point, they wrote a similar covenant which bound one man to another for the good and preservation of them all. This agreement for self-government, signed on November 11, 1620, is better known as the Mayflower Compact. And is, in many ways, you've got God in the scriptures, but this is the most, in addition to that, this is the most important document in America's history, which was signed by 41 of the adult male passengers. It began like this. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten and loyal subjects of the dread, <laughs> the dread sovereign Lord. You see, there's some, oh, all right, King James, oh, you know, okay. Um, by the grace of God have undertaken, have undertaken, now get this, people say, were they Christians? Were they Christians? Well, they weren't really Christians. We don't know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're all that kind of garbage today. Why? Because they want to erase our history. They want to erase that we knew God, that we knew Jesus Christ, and that when they came over, they we were a Christian uh, people, a Christian nation, okay? But it says, um, <laughs> so, um, okay, it began, in the name of God, amen, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, by the grace of God, having undertaken, why? For the glory of God, and what else? For the advancement of the Christian faith. It can't get any more clear than that. Okay? By the grace of God, for the glory of God, and the advancement of the Christian faith. Okay? It doesn't say all these others. Jesus, you know, there's one way to heaven. Okay? No man can come to the Father except through him, through Jesus. Right? Okay? Uh, we do solemnly and mutually swear in the, in the presence of God to one another a covenant and combine ourselves together. This was the only place on the face of the earth where free Christian people were creating their own government, electing civil leadership. It was the only time in history when a nation from scratch was based upon God's word. The Mayflower Compact was the first stone laid in the foundation of the government of the United States of America. With the foundational framework for the colony laid, they then turned their attention to find the most conductive place to settle. They found a protective harbor, which had been cleared by the Indians a number of years earlier. These Indians had been wiped out by a plague. The pilgrims named that clearing Plymouth. 
Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, okay? Uh, they lay on over, they stepped off into Plymouth, the rock there, Plymouth Rock, okay? So that's how you know later. Uh, being, in the, being the start of the winter in harsh land, okay? This is a northeastern winter, okay? Uh, they now had to go about the business of survival and building their new home. Although they had already gone through unbelievable dangers and hardships, the worst was yet to come. Their food was virtually gone, and they were so weakened by the rigors of the crossing and having to work outside in what would be the middle of December in a howling New England winter. Now, I don't know about you guys, I've been through some tough winters, but let's say the Northeast, wintertime, there's a reason that people move to Florida, <laughs> right? Isn't that true? Right? They move to Florida because they don't want to be in the Northeast anymore. I'll tell you, I used to live down in Florida, man. People from New York and uh, Pennsylvania, all, all, you know, all kinds of people from the north, they, they, you know, they, they had it, and we got five or six in our own congregation in the wintertime at itself, right? So it makes sense, right? A northeastern winter is really, really, really bad. A uh, New England winter. So uh, they went about meeting and building a place, building a residence, uh, and it was very difficult at that time. They committed to build, to build their meeting house first, their, their place of worship. They decided to build that first. Now think about that, guys. They don't even have a house to live in. The first thing they build is a place of worship? Wow! Right? Now I'm sure some of them could take shelter. All of them could take shelter initially in that. But that first winter, about one half of their members died of the cold, malnutrition, and disease. They soon learned to gather shellfish along the beach after high tide, there was some wild game available to them, but almost no vegetables whatsoever. Their faith was strong, and their faith sustained them. When the Mayflower went back to England in April, even after losing half of their people, okay? Think about this. They've been through the, a very terrible winter. They lost half of their people, right? And yet not a single person got back on the Mayflower to go back. No one, right? Because they believed in the rightness of their cause, and they knew that they, even though it's tough here, we have freedom. We have freedom to worship. And you know what? We need to appreciate that freedom more today. We need to be thankful for that freedom to worship today. Because of those that went through such a terrible time to first get that freedom. With the coming of the spring and all their food supply exhausted, something wonderful happened to them. An Indian named Squanto uh, of the main Indians came to visit them. He'd been captured as a young man and taken to England. Now think about that for a minute. <laughs> He'd been captured before they got there, okay, and was taken back to England, right? And so when they, when they, when uh, the Squanto is back looking for his family, Squanto already knows their language. That is an act of the providence of Almighty God. Really, truly, if you think about it. Now, he can communicate not only with them, but he can communicate also with the Indians as well. Okay? The day of England, he learned the English language. When he, was, when he was allowed to return to America, he learned that his tribe had been wiped out by a plague. The pilgrims were now living uh, in that very territory that the tribe used to live in. He turned out to be the key to their survival. God working through them. Turned out to be the key to their survival. He taught them how to trap eels in the mud when the, uh, after the high tides. He taught them what berries they could eat. He taught them how to plant corn, which they called maize. Okay? Um, and Governor Bradford would say this. He'd write this in his diary. Squanto remained with us and was, was our interpreter between the pilgrims and the Indian tribe nearby. He was, a, he was a special instrument sent by God for our good. Guys, if we just study our history... We know, I mean, just how close people were and how much they walked with God and the example that they set for us. We, we have been a Christian nation before. And it's time for us in Jesus' name, in love, with respect, but firmly, say we started out as a Christian nation and by the power of God, with God's help, we are going to return to being a Christian nation once again. That's what we need to do. I believe all my heart we need to do that. Now, first, we need to live individually for Christ. No question, we need the best church we can possibly be. But we also, with God's help, need to help to restore. Uh, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's what it says, doesn't it? Okay? Kiss the Son. Okay? Give honor to the Son. Uh, kiss the Son unless his, uh, or His anger will burn against you. Right? And He will destroy you. Okay? We need to honor the Lord. We need to return to being a Christian people, Christian nation. I'm, I'm saying broadly. Okay? All right, now, 
individually and formally. Uh, during the next fall, after harvest, the pilgrims were joined by the Indians for a mutual feast to give thanks to God for his protection and provision. With the works behind them, the pilgrims were, uh, the pilgrims were to build a small but moderately successful colony where the Bible, the Bible, and the church were the hub of their lives. With God's help, I would love to see us as a culture return to that. Where the Bible and the church are the hub of people's lives. Because honestly today, many are too distracted. Okay? <clears throat> more, from, uh, more from Holland and England immigrated to their colony. They were finally able to pay back their investors with uh, trapping furs that they sent back. Uh, out of the small beginnings, out of the small beginnings, great things uh, have been produced. The light that was kindled, kindled was to be shown to many. In Acts in chapter 14, verse 22, it says this. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The pilgrims went through a great deal of hardships. I hope by sharing this, it has been an encouragement to you uh, to make you more aware, to know your history, to be inspired. But I hope as well, the most important, that in this, you have seen the hand of God. God raises up nations, and God abandons nations or just lets them be destroyed. So it's up to us. If we will return to God and follow God and restore him and his word, I think there's a bright future for us. But if we continue to drift, uh, our nation, like the others before us, will be destroyed. So let's be God's people. Let's be uh, a Christian nation once again. So, um, from leaving England, now think about this, from leaving England to seeking religious freedom, wanting their children to honor the Lord and be holy, God's provision of ships and finances, God's protection during the storms, they didn't shipwreck, they didn't sink, making it across the Atlantic, yet not being able to travel further south, okay, all right, which allowed them to establish a Christian colony, then staying together, God leading them through so much to make, make them reliant upon him, the founding of the Christian compact, the first Christian compact in the world, their reliance upon, upon, uh, upon God and his word, God sending Squanto, who knew their language, and who taught them how to, uh, to plant food, they're making a bit of making food, uh, uh, raise food, to America becoming, get this, now I don't know if this is still the case now, but at least in the past, America, at least at one time, sent out more Christian missionaries than any other country in the history of the world. Now, I don't know if that's still true today or not, but when I was, when I was in mission, mission class at Bible college, it was the case. Think about that. The Lord honored their faith. The Lord honored their commitment to where this land did and has, has become a place where the gospel has spread around the world. I hope and pray that you see the hand of God and the providence of God in all of this. I hope and pray that each of us will have a greater understanding and appreciation for God and who He is and how He worked in their lives and how He will work in our lives as well. I hope that we will remember our history and also with God's help that we will repent of our sins and, re and return and that we will have revival in this land once again. Give thanks to God for who He is. Give thanks to God. That, that community meditation fit perfectly. Okay? Give thanks to God for who He is. His wonderful acts. His salvation. Give thanks to God for His glory and His holiness. Give thanks to God for His deeds among the peoples, among the nations. God has been so good to us. Let us thank Him and praise Him and live for Him. Be encouraged. Share the truth about the history. Share the truth about history with your family. This morning, this morning, I hope that this has opened your eyes. I hope that, you know, you guys learned some of this for the first time. I hope it's something that sink in and be like, no, we are a Christian nation. You turn to a Christian nation. This morning, be appreciative, be thankful. And if you have a decision to make this morning for Jesus Christ, please come forward as we sing our invitation song this morning.
the first and last stanza as well. <laughs> so good to us. Remember to thank him and praise him and individually, but also as a family. Um, God loves you. We love you. Thank you all for being here. My voice is shocked. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Ed, will you uh, pray for us? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we had a message today. And help us to always uh, be thankful, not just during this uh, Thanksgiving time, but help us to always be thankful and help us always to look to you. Help us to be the nation you'd have us to be. Help us to uh, gather our people together and and uh, pray and serve you in, in many ways, always looking to you, Heavenly Father. And watch over all those on our prayer list, watch over this church and congregation, watch over our country and our world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Have a great week. <laughs>